Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Subodh Dave, Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and a very warm welcome to you all to this webinar um, on uh, the legacies of uh, psychiatry and eugenics. Um, uh, when I when I discuss this topic with um, some of my friends and and my family, um, my daughter actually mentioned that um, uh, how how can you have psychiatry and eugenics occurring in the same sentence. And how, how come you're having an exhibition on eugenics at the Royal College of Psychiatrists? Um, and I know that um, the, the topic of conversation today uh, will touch upon some painful painful issues. I think uh, we, we've all been familiar with the legacy of eugenics. Um, uh, we, we, we know that eugenics what literally means good creation uh, in a twisted way led to the uh, you know, the death of thousands and thousands of people, 100,000 mental ill people, 5,000 children were killed in Nazi Germany, 400,000 people um, experienced forced sterilizations, but it didn't stop there. And I think, you know, I think um, I, uh, when I was a research fellow in Birmingham as a trainee, I used to lead a special study module on the history of psychiatric research. And um, and it wasn't that long ago, even in the 60s and 70s, and not, not just in Nazi Germany, but in, you know, USA uh, and other parts of the world, we had uh, people with intellectual disabilities injected with viruses without any consent um, uh, as, part of, as part of research. So I think, um, um, and, and, and then, you know, in the UK, I think uh, uh, more recently, I think people may recall the whole debate around dangerous and severe personality disorder. So the issues that we are going to touch upon are, are, are not just about what happened in the past. And as a dean, uh, I have a particular interest in this because I feel that this topic reminds us that, um, that we, we have to learn from history. You know, I want to think um, uh, because uh, these lessons help us sharpen our tools, uh, sharpen our tools of what is good, uh, who decides, who gets to decide what is good, um, and um, and you know how how do we practice ethically and safely in the modern world when we all want to keep pace with the developments in modern uh, genetics, uh, modern personalization, precision medicine, precision psychiatry agenda, um, and um, and uh, you know I hope that uh, this webinar and the exhibition, uh, some of you may be familiar that we have a parallel exhibition running at the college, uh, will will help us do that. The exhibition is open till the 24th of February, 2023. So do come and visit uh, if you are a member of the college, it's open to all members. Um, and um, um, my my heartfelt thanks to Professor Marius uh, Turda, whom I would like to introduce um, next. He's a professor from Oxford Brookes University. And thank you so much, uh, Marius, for loaning us this exhibition and for uh, bringing this important topic to the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And as I said, hopefully, the lessons that we learn will shape our our practice and our thinking. So thank you very much and welcome to all. I look forward to hearing more from you, Maris. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Marius Durda, Professor of the History of Biomedicine at Oxford Brookes University. And it is my pleasure to moderate this discussion about psychiatry and eugenics hosted by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'll just say a few words by way of introduction, then have my colleagues make their presentation. And if time permits, I'd like to say a few words of conclusion. But before we start, uh, let me just say thank you to my guests for accepting the invitation to contribute to this discussion, to the college, its staff and Dean Subor Dave, and to the History of Psychiatry um, Special Interest Group. This event, is part of a larger undertaking, which also includes an exhibition, as it was mentioned, an attempt, if you wish, to engage and come to terms with legacies of eugenics. In 1883, the Victorian polymath Francis Galton coined the term eugenics, drawing on the Greek expression, well-born. He defined eugenics as the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations either physically or mentally. As a self-styled scientific theory of race betterment and planned breeding, eugenics prioritizes 
the life of individuals who are deemed socially, culturally, and biologically worthy of reproduction over those considered less so. These latter individuals were continuously marginalized. And their disability and difference repeatedly reinforced through eugenic legislation and state sanctioned policies of institutionalization, segregation, and stigmatization. They were often described as a burden on the resources of the state and of the healthy majority. In some countries, such as the United States, Sweden, or Japan, they were sterilized. In other countries, such as Nazi Germany, their lives were deemed entirely unworthy of living, and they were murdered. A complex amalgam of influences from literature to art and from anthropology to medicine, alongside an obsession with degeneration and decline, concerns with empire, and racial supremacy, and the idea of society as an organism in need of constant supervision yielded attachment to eugenics. It was applied more readily in some countries than in others. It influenced the development of some academic disciplines more than others and appealed to some scientists more than to others. Early 20th century psychiatrists were amongst the first to be receptive to eugenics. Many of them embraced it as a scientific, efficient and forward-looking way of dealing with modern society's many problems, such as poverty, criminality and prostitution, all framed around a perceived increase in the number of people they described as mentally deficient and feeble-minded. In Britain, prominent psychiatrists, among them George Shuttleworth, Alfred Treadgold, Friedrich Mott, James Crichton Brown, or Carlos Blacker, complained that modern society, with all its technological and medical advances, was allowing too many individuals with hereditary defects to reproduce. They also vigorously debated the practical application of eugenic principles, particularly sterilization, to the overall improvement of the genetic quality of the population. Some of them wrote influential textbooks, shaping the training of generations of medical students. Tread Gold's 1908, or Conventional Deficiency, for instance, went through several editions until the 1950s. It was one of the basic texts for the training of both doctors and nurses, adding medical credibility to why then the widely popular view that the so-called mentally deficient people were useless and that society needed to be protected from them. For more than a century, eugenic has depended upon the fiction that its methods were scientifically sound and its goals were achievable. While we questioned its goals historically, we also need to examine which assumptions and attitudes rooted in eugenics continue to affect our world in ways both hidden and obvious. As we will hear in the following presentation sought by its involvement with eugenics, the challenge for institutions, professional associations and psychiatrists now is to work out how to untangle their relationship. My colleagues are experts who have made significant contribution to this field. Let me introduce them briefly in order of their presentation. First, we have Matthew Thompson, who is a professor of history at the University of Warwick and the author of The Problem of Mental Deficiency, Eugenics, Democracy and Social Policy in Britain, 1870-1959. Next speaker is Brendan Kelly, a professor of psychiatry at Trinity College Dublin and the author of In Search of Madness, A Psychiatrist's Travels Through the History of Mental Illness. And finally, we have Frank Stanish, who is professor of history at the University of Calgary and the editor with Emma Grubegovic of Psychiatry and the Legacies of Eugenics, Historical Studies of Alberta and Beyond. And now I turn to Matthew for his presentation.
Um, I hope hope you can all um, see the um, the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, eugenics and psychiatry in Britain in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and as Marius has highlighted, British psycho psychiatry was deeply involved in eugenic policy in this period. And that's important to remember and understand. But my paper is also going to highlight that there are also limitations to this involvement. And I think that's worth appreciating and understanding too. It's also important to recognize that even before there was a thing called eugenics, the doctors who took control of the new mental asylums of 19th century Britain commonly attributed mental illness to heredity. And this is the kind of issue that's explored in this work by Theodore Porter. So in a sense, psychiatry's involvement in this area and its significance precedes, significantly precedes eugenics. And if this paper was to go beyond the mid 20th century, it would show that the same is true of psychiatric thinking about genetics after eugenics fell out of favor through association with Nazi abuses. As the size of the asylum population rose towards a remarkable 100,000 in Britain by the end of the 19th century, and with cure rates remaining low, it is unsurprising that this subject of inherited insanity was prominent once a eugenics movement did take shape. There were indeed some Victorian psychiatrists whose theorization of hereditary degeneration added weight to eugenic argument at the end of the century. Henley Maudsley is a notable example. But these figures did not tend to be the, to the very forefront as the movement emerged in support of eugenic education and social policy, spearheaded by the Eugenic Society from 1907. Historians have been very interested in the membership of this organization, Eugenic Society, and they point to the prevalence of the middle classes and particular professionals. Psychiatrists, however, were never a particularly prominent constituency, despite the mentally ill being a central focus of concern. I think this is kind of interesting. It would be wrong, moreover, to regard the asylums themselves as, I think, inspired by eugenics. The timing is simply wrong. The 19th century asylums clearly emerged a long time before that. The, the, the causes of their emergence, I think, are distinctly different. The first half of the 20th century would nevertheless see what was by a long way the most important achievement of the eugenics movement in Britain. This was the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913. This new class of person, the mental defective, was made up of the so-called idiots and imbeciles who had already been certifiable under the lunacy legislation of the 19th century but also the so-called feeble-minded and moral defectives, not previously certifiable. What distinguished mental defectives from the insane was that they were seen as having a congenital mental dis disability, often in our terms, a learning disability. Seen as incurable, they helped explain the failure, not just of asylums, but of prisons, workhouses, even schools. The feeble-minded were a particular concern from a eugenic perspective, as they sat on the borderline of mental normality and were seen as liable to reproduce more prolifically due to weak moral re restraint. By the end of the 1930s, there were around 50,000 people segregated from society in these institutions. Often in Britain, they were they were termed colonies and they kind of vision of 
that they had was of creating a life involving you know, work as well as as as, uh, as care segregated off from the rest of society and these are images from one such colony i think this is a remarkable figure this figure of 50 approaching 50000 but to many contemporaries it did not go far enough the government-sponsored Wood Report of 1929 indicated that levels of mental deficiency were now at 1% of the population, an apparent doubling since the Royal Commission on the Feeble-Minded of nine, that had led to the 1913 legislation. Therefore, alongside the policy of segregation, minds were turned towards two other solutions. The first was very much part of the legislative armory from the start. Local authorities were instructed to provide supervision for mental defectives in the community. Here they could build upon charitable, charitable work that was already well underway. But the legislation would see significant growth in this area, increasingly incorporating the profession of social workers. By the end of the 1930s, there were even more mental defectives under supervision in the community than there were in institutions. Working with the groups who provided such care, psychiatry was involved in setting up guardianship and licensing schemes in the community. Inspired in part by eugenics, these, this supervision aimed to police uh, the danger of eugenics, the danger of sexual activity amongst so-called mental defectives. Supervision was nevertheless psychiatry's arguably first major experiment in community care. And I think it's a reminder of the risk in seeing things in black and white. The second alternative to segregation was a policy of, se of sexual sterilization. Britain was in some ways unusual among comparable progressive non-Catholic countries in not introducing legislation in this area. There were, however, in fact, several attempts and some quite significant support for the policy. The reasons for defeat are complicated. The issue I want to stress here, however, is that Britain had already enacted the mental deficiency legislation on a, a major scale. The kind of voluntary sterilization policies that were being proposed would have been only a minor supplement, enabling more effective supervision in the community, and relieving some pressure on institutions. Sterilization, in other words, did not fail because of an absence of eugenic sentiment or willingness to act in the United Kingdom. On the contrary, the UK was already seen as a leader in implementing an effective eugenic policy. Given the audience today, I will consider one final question that was um, which is the position of psychiatry on these policies and in relation to eugenics. Here, I would urge an element of caution. Mental health policy, at least in this one area of mental deficiency, may have been inspired in part by eugenics, and psychiatrists may have been important in delivery, but they were not they were not particularly prominent in driving things forward on eugenic grounds. The doctors who acted as superintendents for the mental deficiency institutions tended to be almost as closed off from the broader world as their patients. They faced a huge daily grind of managing these complex understaffed sites. Rarely did they have the time to be involved in campaigning on something like eugenics. Just 10 psychiatrists were members of the Eugenics Society by 1937, and this was a rise from a lower figure earlier on. In the campaigns for the passage of the Mental Deficiency Act, and then again in the campaign for voluntary sterilization, it was people working in the community, not psychiatrists, who led the way. The Royal Medico-Psychological Association, your four for, for, um, uh, uh, you, uh, that, that turns into the Royal College of, of Psychiatrists, was highly cautious when it came to sterilization, organizing a second vote when members initially showed support on a low turnout. 
and steering the official position towards delay and further research. There was little desire amongst the leaders, I think, of the profession to further stigmatize their work through association with this policy. And when the resulting government commission reported on the issue in 1934, it indicated that the policy of sterilization would at best enable just five to 10% of patients to be licensed out into the community. There were, however, of course, a small number of psychiatrists who were prominent supporters of eugenics. In a case such as Elliot Slater, we have a psychiatrist who was at the cutting edge of research on the genetics of mental illness, in close contact with German scientists who, whose work at the time was regarded as leading in the field. In the case of C.P. Blacker, secretary of the Eugenics Society for much of the interwar period, we have a figure whose background in psychiatry was detached again from the management of huge institutions and who was keen instead to steer eugenics towards addressing broader mental fitness through expansion of access to contraception. He saw voluntary sterilization in those terms and was keen to distinguish it from com the compulsory approach seen in Germany and the United States. For people like Blacker, the graph on the left there, of, which is about uh, the, the pre central preoccupation of the eugenics movement was differential class fertility. The fact that the middle classes were uh, breeding less uh, than the lower classes and their, their assumption that this was gonna have a profound eugenic impact on the population. This was his central concern. The mental defectives increasingly were a small part of that broader concern. The final reason for caution in aligning psychiatry with eugenics in the British context is that me the mental deficiency system cannot be seen as just a eugenic policy. Yes, for sure, on the feeble-minded borderlines, there were people housed in these new institutions who would not have been there without eugenics. But there were far more who did need some sort of care or assistance who, or who weren't finding it. Uh, uh, even on the feeble-minded borderline, eugenics was not the only factor driving the provision of care and control. Most important of all was the idea of individuals being socially inadequate, unable to support themselves, a danger to themselves and others. Mental deficiency was therefore indeed the most significant legacy of psychiatry's eugenic orientation in Britain, and something that we need to remember and learn from but to see that policy simply as a product of eugenics, or to see psychiatry itself as driving that policy outcome would be an exercise I want to suggest in oversimplification and risk learning the wrong lessons. As finally, as Marius said, um, if anyone wants to find out any more about anything more about this, please turn to the, the, the book where I set out these arguments in much greater length, uh, The Problem of Mental Deficiency. I think I'm going to be handing over now to Brendan Kelly. Thank you, Matthew. Uh I'm not Brendan Kelly. I just want to say thank you. And uh, we're now going to cross the Irish Sea into Ireland, and uh, I'm welcoming Brendan to this conversation. Brendan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marius, and thanks to the college and everyone attending uh, for having me here. I will now attempt to share my screen, um, and hopefully that will work out well for me. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, eugenics in Ireland, and um, the psychiatric system, as it were, in Ireland um, at this time. What I'm going to talk about can be found in these in these two books here, particularly in search of madness. I guess maybe some people who are attending today might not have you know, a very sort of deep knowledge of of sort of the the origins of this 
this whole movement. Um, and Marius alluded to some of this in the introduction, but this is a really interesting book um, about some of the early um, legislation in the United States, uh, the Supreme Court, American eugenics and sterilization um, for those who are interested in the Virginia Sterilization Act of 1924 in the US, which was one of the re relatively early interesting pieces of legislation. As Marius referred to as well, perhaps the best known example, although um, it should be better known, I guess, is the um, in Nazi Germany's uh, program Action T4, uh, which was a basically a, uh, a, a program for, um, well, I, I, it built on a sterilization program, but, but basically for killing people with mental illness. Uh, intellectual disability and um, other conditions. And just this summer, I was lucky enough to visit Hadamar in Germany, which is a memorial, has a memorial museum looking at this uh, at this program. So the website of Hadamar is well worth a look for those interested in this topic and the town and the hospital well worth a visit. There is an exhibition there looking at how, if you like, the psychiatric system and the hospitals were used in what was the largest program um, of uh, eugenics, if you like, in the area of psychiatry. So that's that's for background, if you like. I'm here in Dublin, and I am um, going to talk a little bit about Ireland. And Ireland, for those of you who don't know, it's a it's a small country, and now we have about five million people in the Republic of Ireland. And up until 1922, uh, Ireland was part of. Um, uh, Great Britain, uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And since 1922, we have been self-governing and still are in the 26 counties of the Republic of Ireland, although the uh, six counties, six counties in the north remain part of the United Kingdom. So what happened in Ireland is all to do with institutions. Um, here is one of the earliest institutions, um, Grange Gorman or St. Brendan's Hospital, which some of you know, which was opened in 1810. But Ireland had a whole range of large psychiatric institutions. I'm just going to show you some pictures. Here's one in Belfast in the north of Ireland, a very large one in Balnasloe in the west of Ireland. Um, you know, very big institutions. Uh, in the early 1900s, for example, the town of Balnasloe had a population of 5,600 people in the town, 5,600. And of those 5,600, um, 2,100 were patients in the asylum. So almost half of the town were patients and the other half worked in it in some way or supplied it. Here's another large institution. We had a lot of them. There's one in Oma, a very large uh, asylum in Mullingar, also in Ireland, as is Sligo in the west of Ireland, now a hotel, uh, another large asylum. It, this is in the very the northern part of the Republic of Ireland in Letterkenny and Here's one in the west of Ireland in Ennis. So what we did in Ireland, and this leads up to the uh, discussion about eugenics, is we, we filled institutions. My colleague here in Trinity College Dublin, Professor Damien Brennan, has really interesting numbers about the, the rise in the uh, number of mentally ill people in institutions. And this, of course, was building up this almost panic in Ireland and around the world that the number of people with mental illness or with mental deficiency was increasing and that something had to be done. Um, many of the people in these institutions, like here, here's a large asylum in, in Carlo in Ireland also, I mean, you know, they, they, they were very, um, they were poor, they were destitute, and they had nowhere else to go. So they were crowding into the hospitals. You can see the the, the torn clothing there in these photographs from uh, the early 1900s from one of the Irish asylums. So with these huge asylums and a pressure to do something to decant people or prevent accumulation, um, certain medical practitioners in Ireland, uh, he, he, Dr. Drapes, for example, in, in Enniscorthy, again in Ireland, look at that, look at the size of that institution. Um, turned to the idea of, um, of eugenics and discussed it in professional psychiatric circles. They, you know, Ireland was very connected with Europe intellectually. They were reading, um, you know, the, the, the Irish psychiatrists of the time would put us to shame today. They were reading books in French and German and really importing ideas. And here, for example, is a report in the Journal of Mental Science in 1910 
of a meeting of the Irish division of the Medico Psychological Association, uh, as Matthew said, the forerunner of the um, Royal, Royal College of Psychiatrists. This is in 1910 in Ireland, and Dr. Drapes, uh, who, who lived in, uh, who, who worked in Enniscorthy, he said that the discussion at the meeting was um, highly suggestive. The 19th century had brought preventive medicine and hygiene, but mental hygiene had been omitted. Hamlet without the prince, he said. Um, he argued that sterilization would be particularly necessary in improvable cases who were discharged from the asylums, quasi recovered, and these should be given a choice between sterilization or perpetual detention. So this was the use of the institution itself uh, as a form of, uh, if you like, preventing, uh, preventing reproduction. So there was this opinion among psychiatrists in Ireland and asylum doctors that there was a need for some form of eugenics. But, and this is critical and it's very paradoxical in Irish history, they ran into a big problem. And the problem in Ireland was the Roman Catholic Church. In Ireland, the Roman Catholic Church exerted enormous influence uh, politically, in terms of education, and in terms of general health care. The church did not run the asylums, but it was highly influential. So when eugenics was spoken of, it interfered with one thing the church in Ireland has always focused on, which is reproduction. So I'm going to refer here to a really interesting paper about the Belfast Eugenics Society. And this paper was written by historian Greta Jones in the Irish Historical Studies Journal. And um, it is well worth reading. It is a superb paper explaining why eugenics did not penetrate into Ireland, even despite some support. And uh, Greta Jones writes that in the case of Ireland, the eugenic ideal was checked or stopped early on. In 1911, a Catholic doctor, uh, Seamus O'Kelly, not related to me, uh, said that eugenics had little chance of being sympathetically received in Ireland if it came weighted with doctrines repugnant to, to the mass of the people. And this this was a very important time because Matthew has referred to the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913. And even though Ireland was part of the United Kingdom at that time, that 1913 Act was never extended to Ireland. So the program that uh, Matthew spoke about, the colonies and so forth, it wasn't extended to Ireland. And part of this was because the church was reluctant to condone intervention in family life, which negative eugenics proposed. So negative eugenics refers to practices like sterilization, abortion and birth control and preventing people from reproducing. Positive eugenics, and the word positive isn't really appropriate, but it's what was used, was to do with um, other people reproducing more and encouraging people perceived as worthy of reproducing, reproducing. But the church was opposed to any interference that involved sterilization, abortion, and so forth. As a result, eugenics did not penetrate in Ireland. The 1913 legislation was not extended to Ireland. And paradoxically, in this instance, the church came to the rescue uh, rather than uh, causing difficulty. What we continued to do, however, was to admit people to psychiatric hospitals. And you can argue that this was a form of segregation that impeded um, likelihood of uh, relationships, marriage and reproduction. By, the by 1966, we had um, the highest rate of psychiatric hospitalization in the world, you know, more than three times that of France, almost double that of England and Wales. So we mightn't have been uh, setting up colonies or engaging in sterilization and so forth, but we had one in every 70 adults in psychiatric hospitals. So I suppose the question is, um, you know, really about eugenics not being a, a binary yes or no um, phenomenon, but maybe a graded one. I'll just finish by adding that following a, a huge number of people in psychiatric hospitals in the 1960s in Ireland, we now have an extremely low number of people. We have the third lowest number of um, beds in the uh, in the European Union here in Ireland, and a rock bottom rate of involuntary admission, less than half of that in England. So we've had this swing from the large institutions to virtually none. So what uh, the point I really wanted to make today, I guess, is that uh, eugenic thinking, um, which was so prominent in the United States, 
uh, obviously in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and in the occupied territories there. And also, um, you know, the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913 that Matthew has spoken about. These ideas came to Ireland, but unusually it was the Catholic Church that opposed this and was so powerful that it prevented it happening, at least explicitly. There was an implicit segregation in our high rates of institutionalization and the associated social disabilities that come with that, the lack of opportunities, although um, our high rates of institutionalization have now declined greatly. So look, that's a little bird's eye view of the situation in one particular country, showing how eugenics had some medical support, but ultimately, as is so often the case in the history of psychiatry, it is social factors other than science, other than medicine, other than psychiatry that have shaped the history of the discipline. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me today. And thank you, Brenton. A much needed perspective from, from Ireland, uh, which obviously complicates the story even more now that we've introduced uh, the Catholic Church into the equation. So uh, let's now move swiftly to uh, Frank, and he will talk about two paradigmatic cases in the history of eugenics and its relationship to psychiatry, um, Nazi Germany and United States or North America. So Frank, the floor is yours. Sorry, I was still muted. Um, good morning and good afternoon uh, from Alberta, Canada. And uh, thank you also very much, uh, Dr. Turda and the college um, for inviting me uh, to join this webinar. Um, when I was uh, first asked uh, to contribute uh, to this webinar, uh, my task was uh, to speak about uh, Canada. Then I found uh, it became America. So uh, today I think I will be talking about uh, Germany and North America. Uh, so the jurisdiction has become ever broader. And it is of course daunting um, to attempt this um, very large topic. And I will only be able to give some cursory, make some cursory remarks and relate um, the presentation to some reference points and uh, leave you with uh, some questions. Now. Dr. Sabbath Dave mentioned in the beginning um, of this webinar that his daughter was asking about this relationship between psychiatry and eugenics. And when we tend to um, the invitation poster of the Second International Congress of Eugenics in 1921, we find it actually here uh, as one of the branches of the so-called eugenics tree. It was an interdisciplinary endeavor, um, inter uh, an intellectual and practical endeavor on um, a largely international scale. And we see so many other disciplines contributing um, to the eugenics enterprise of which psychiatry was one, but a very important one. Now, my own interest um, in eugenics became furthered uh, through a uh, interdisciplinary um, and multi-center um, group research activity um, that was headed by um, Dr. Robert A. Wilson, um, a philosopher at the University of Edmonton in Alberta. The Eugenics Archives, um, which ran from 2010 to 2017, we had a little extension at the end, and it was um, uh, primarily a community university research alliance. So the research was carried out together uh, with community stakeholders and what is very important, also um, former sterilization survivors. I would warmly like to invite you to visit um, the website that was produced as a publicly public looking um, element and uh, product of this uh, research um, interaction. And um, particularly the tab um, that lists interviews, um, which um, 
uh, shows you interviews with um, eugenic survivors, including Lailani Muir, um, the late Lailani Muir, um, who got the uh, court case uh, rolling in the province of Alberta in 1972, leading to the final repeal of the program, which was running from 1928 to 1972. Um, so a vast period um, of time and right into the Second World War, um, which might be the most irritating uh, fact about it. Um, researchers came from multiple disciplines and various levels um, of academic and non-academic um, interests and perspectives, and um, this will also be reflected um, in the um, web um, uh, archive um, that is uh, internationally accessible. One of the products, um, as um, uh, Maris Turda has alluded to, um, was our edited collection on psychiatry and the legacy of our eugenics, um, since in the Alberta case, psychiatrists and mental health nurses um, played a major role. And of course, we didn't want to focus it alone on um, one province, um, but seeing the province in a way as a model, uh, test case, and also a comparative reference uh, related it to also international perspectives. From 1928 to 1972, the Alberta Sexual Sterilization Act, as it was called, Canada's lengthiest eugenic policy, shaped social discourses and medical practice in the province. Sterilization programs, particularly involuntary sterilization programs, were responding both nationally and internationally to social anxieties produced by the perceived connection between mental degeneration and heredity. And we find a very strong interest among psychiatrists um, in the development of eugenics in the mental health field. You'll find this um, reflected in terms of uh, chapters looking at um, the scientific background um, and the discussion around pseudoscience at the time, uh, involvement of nurses, um, perspectives on comparative perspectives on Canada and um, the United States, as well as Germany. And um, we also um, connected uh, the historical exploration to modern insights into the um, legacies in the disability community, uh, such as in the chapters by uh, Workman and Walbrink. If you're interested, um, this is also available through Athabasca University Press um, in a uh, open access format. Now, the period um, that today I will be concerned with um, is the period between 1900 and 1940, um, as seen on this uh, chronological uh, table here. And um, as pointed out, the eugenic sterilization um, program in Alberta ran from 1928 to 1972. Now, very early on, uh, 1869, with uh, Francis Galton, who was mentioned by Dr. Turda in the beginning, in his uh, book, Hereditary Genius, we're seeing pedigree charts um, being introduced into the scientific and scholarly literature something that psychiatrists became increasingly interested in. Um, many of you will know Emil Krapelin's um, Psychopathology, um, the leading textbook in the German-speaking world um, from the uh, German Research Institute in Munich, um, where also pedigree charts um, became introduced in relating um, psychopathology uh, to genetic reinterpretations of the inheritance of uh, psychiatric diseases. More um, prominent um, became uh, the application of biological uh, perspectives to social um, issues, as was already uh, emphasized by my preceding uh, colleagues and their presentations um, in the principles of biology um, introduced by the British um, philosopher and economist, early sociologist, if you like, uh, Herbert Spencer. Um, and um, in the literature, um, it is often alluded to as a foundational text of social Darwinism, the application of biological principles to social uh, problems such as urbanization, modernization, and malnutrition in large um, urban centers of the time. That, of course, um, 
also interested uh, the eugenicists and the psychiatrists um, who were affiliating with the eugenics thinking. We find eugenic societies um, being founded very early in the 20th century, 1904 in Germany, uh, there rather under the rubric of uh, racial anthropology, 1907 in England, 1910 in the US, and in 1930 in Canada, there about um, one generation later. Um, and in the US, um, Charles Davenport um, was one of the major figures, um, a zoologist by training, founder of the American Eugenic Society, into which he also actively recruited um, psychiatrists and um, receiving fun major financial support through the Rockefeller, Kellogg, Carnegie, Harriman, and Ford Foundations. So uh, philanthropic um, support and ideas um, of um, white Anglo-Saxon um, supremacy uh, somewhat crept in already in the background through the funding model um, that was applied. We find um, the political application of eugenics ideas in an international um, perspective, um, as was already alluded to. Uh, Stefan Kuhl's book, I think, is really uh, a cornerstone um, to this uh, perspective, 1994. Um, the uh, forced sterilization as being one arm only of um, several uh, aggressive and um, uh, top-down approaches being taken in the wider field of public health um, during the period under consideration here. In the USA, starting with Indiana in 1907, I mentioned Alberta in 1928, um, Germany 1933, um, and um, various other um, European uh, countries to follow. But it was also um, complemented by immigration restrictions in Canada, for example, with 1919, the new Immigration Act Amendment, particularly uh, geared against um, immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. And then, of course, uh, the infamous Nazi euthanasia program, starting with the beginning of the Second World War in um, Germany, um, later um, Austria and uh, Central Europe. Forced sterilization laws uh, were inaugurated in over 30 states um, in the US. Um, and as we can find on this map, uh, they were predominantly uh, in the industrial north, northern states, um, then also the western and um, eastern coast states. Uh, later, uh, Texas also uh, joined um, this uh, group. Uh, it is interesting, um, as uh, Gar Allen, a historian of uh, biology from Washington University in St. Louis, has pointed out in uh, 2010, uh, that the southern states, um, despite their um, uh, 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 slavery <clears throat> legacy, um, more or less adhered to a predominant um, paternalistic model so that uh, interestingly enough, uh, despite the racism inherent um, in uh, the community in these states, uh, that less um, eugenics um, leg legislations were inaugurated there. Um, this brings us um, to uh, the attraction of eugenics um, um, by psychiatrists. Um, and uh, when we look at the archives of the Rockefeller uh, Foundation in New York, um, they were particularly um, uh, moved by the uh, German um, uh, progress as they saw it um, in eugenics. The German psychiatrist upon the peculiar characteristics connected with the problem of heredity, the latter named scientists are studying the most delicate changes which take place in the brain of one who becomes sick. This is happening um, at a watershed moment in the history of psychiatry and neurology in Germany. And I just want to mention my recent book uh, with McGill Queen's University Press, A New Field in Mind, um, that this interdisciplinary nature um, is also playing out on the level of eugenics and uh, racial anthropology, as well as the age of nervousness and uh, devastating effects of the First World War that Germany was trying to come to grips with. Um, well, eugenic ideas um, were um, advocated for by leading psychiatrists of the time, uh, Auguste Forel in Switzerland, um, likewise Konstantin von Monakov, a neurologist in Switzerland, Emil Krapelin already mentioned, but also Alois Alzheimer and the infamous Ernst Rudin, um, 
one of the founders of psychiatric uh, epidemiology in the modern uh, period. And this was, in a sense, mirrored in North America, where in Canada you have Charles Kirk Clark, um, Aldo Bloomer, um, and uh, John McEachran um, in Alberta, uh, the first ones um, in Ontario, Adolf Mayer um, in the United States, and Davenport, um, somewhat uh, bridging uh, two other uh, fields. A lesson of um, uh, awareness perhaps here is um, what I have called um, in our book, uh, the eugenics paradox. Eugenics um, was not just um, sort of a right wing um, racist nationalist um, uh, perspective as many perhaps would see it, but at the time it was also shared um, by um, progressive left leaning um, researchers and physicians. An interesting case um, is uh, Kurt Goldstein, um, known for his holist approaches in neuropsychiatry, um, who early on, under the influence of his mentor, um, Alfred Hoche, um, of the uh, infamous book, um, Annihilation of Life Not Worth Living, which becomes somewhat a basic text for uh, Nazi uh, philosophers um, in medicine. Um, under this influence was writing just before um, the outbreak of the First World War, Über Rassenhygiene, um, which would have been somewhat, uh, for our purposes here, synonymous with on uh, eugenics. Um, in it, um, he applies also a progressive um, understanding of how biological um, uh, contributions could actually reinform and uh, lead social um, uh, projects um, at the time. And this is not unique to Germany and Central Europe. We, for example, find it also um, in the um, um, central member of the uh, cooperative Commonwealth um, a foundation in uh, uh, Saskatchewan, um, the party that led to the introduction of um, universal health care uh, in Canada. In his uh, master's thesis, um, which was actually in theology in 1933, uh, he was writing about uh, sterilization as an element uh, for the betterment of the core family. When he visited Nazi Germany in 1936, uh, he was so appalled by what he saw that he revised his views. Um, and the revision is also taking place in uh, neuropsychiatrist uh, Kurt Goldstein. He himself became a victim uh, to uh, the forced migration um, uh, movement um, that he was ousted as a Jewish physician um, from his position, had to flee Nazi Germany in 1933 and arrived in the United States in 1935, as we're seeing here. So from afar, we, he was uh, witnessing how um, the euthanasia program um, became um, ever more drastic um, and um, um, ever more um, uh, uh, murderous um, in Nazi Germany. Um, some numbers here are the forced sterilization in the Third Reich uh, amounted to more than 400,000 uh, cases um, from the beginning of the program as Gerrit Hohendorf and his group of researchers have uh, established um, in 2018. Uh, the Nazi euthanasia program was intended to end the life of those not worth living for which Hoche and Binding have provided um, the um, legitimizing text um, which um, the Nazis assumed and that also Adolf Hitler had read at Landsberg uh, when he was imprisoned after the Munich Putsch. Um, and then when we uh, take a look at um, the uh, euthanasia program, um, which uh, already uh, Matthew Thompson uh, has uh, mentioned uh, earlier, um, we're looking at more than 80,000 uh, estimated uh, victims, um, so the number even higher than what we have found in the literature before recent years, as established by Dr. Weindling, uh, 2016, also from Oxford Brookes um, University. Um, this leads me to the end of my um, presentation. Um, just want to highlight um, that John McEachran, um, the uh, chair of the eugenics board, um, often described as the bulldog who never let go before uh, his uh, final retirement um, and was uh, responsible for 
um, approving most of the over 2,800 uh, forced sterilization in Alberta, um, was in fact uh, the only um, graduate student of Wilhelm Wundt, the experimental psychologist um, in Germany. He used this authority while he had never published on experimental psychology himself, uh, never um, published on <clears throat> questions of um, the measurement of uh, heredity uh, himself, um, uh, remained in this position, and this was one of the starting moments um, for our research group that the uh, the portrait was still in the Department of uh, Philosophy and Psychology at the University of, of Alberta in Edmonton. Now it was uh, taken off as also one part of the uh, outcomes um, of the research project. And um, a final remark um, is that uh, the actual assessment of individual cases such as Lailani Moyers um, took uh, only 10 minutes um, in the meetings of the Alberta Eugenics Board, uh, where uh, in uh, 1934, with um, the um, amendment of the Sexual Sterilization Act, uh, it actually decreased to five minutes. So within five minutes, the assessment uh, was done and a verdict uh, was uh, spoken out. And as we're seeing here on the left um, for psychiatrists, this covered almost the whole spectrum of psychiatry into which these uh, very flexible, in quotation marks, on diagnosis uh, could be factored in. I thank you for your attention, and if you'd like to read more into the relationship um, between uh, German and North American developments, you can do so in the Canadian Bulletin for the History of Medicine 2014. Thank you very much, and over to Dr. Tudor. Thank you, Frank, very much indeed. And uh, I only have a couple of minutes left, so I'll try to be as brief as possible, which is nearly impossible considering the richness of the papers presented. But I do hope this is a conversation is going to continue. And by way of postscript, as if I just picking up from where you left, Frank, I just want to say one thing first, which is that one persistent interpretation describes the rise and fall of eugenics through the lens of the Nazi racial state and the Holocaust. And of course, central to this view is that after 1945, the backlash from scientists and politicians across the Western world dealt a decisive blow to eugenics alongside efforts at combating uh, racist sciences through the UNESCO statements on race, for example. So it is generally believed that when peace was declared in 1945, it brought with it not only the defeat of Nazi Germany, but also the near condemnation of eugenics. But now we know it did not happen this way. Outside of Germany, eugenicists were not tarnished by their association with Nazi racism and the Holocaust. In countries such as Britain, as we heard briefly in the United States and across South America, eugenics continued to attract support well into the 1960s, most notably in relation to issues affecting the poor and the working class, such as birth control, Planned Parenthood, voluntary sterilization, and the so-called problem families, which was a very big topic uh, in Britain in the 1950s and 60s, debated by eugenicists associated with the eugenic society. Ideas of economic and social productivity flowed very readily from a eugenic vocabulary, which may have been pruned of its excessive racist connotation, but which nevertheless remained in use throughout the 1960s and 70s. Well then, hopefully the presentations you heard today will contribute to the ongoing conversation we have about the problematic relationship between psychiatry and eugenics, the persistence of eugenic ideas into the 21st century, and not just in psychiatry, but more broadly in society, in sciences and in politics. The ability to respond forcefully to any form of discrimination requires, I think, that we confront our eugenic past and its tentacular personifications in the present. And this remains a very sensitive issue and an emotional issue for many people, not least because for so long, eugenics has reinforced discriminatory practices based on race, on class and gender, disability and age. So um, eugenics, as we heard, um, was truly global. And whilst the full extent of its impact will probably never be known, it certainly cut deep and wide into the texture of our modern world. So it is imperative, I think, that we engage with it and we reclaim the space 
it occupied for so long in academic and cultural and scientific and social life. Finally, healing the deep wounds caused by more than a century of eugenics requires public recognition of those wronged in the past and of those who continue to be mistreated in the present. Evidence indicated the present day potentiality of eugenics are, alas, not difficult to find. I, as many of you I'm sure, was shocked by the disgraceful behavior towards vulnerable adults with a mental illness at Edelfield Center, which was presented yesterday on the BBC Panorama program. But this is an essential step forward. If broader social, gender and racial justice projects are to succeed. Thank you very much indeed to my colleagues and to all of you for attending. And thank you, Katie, for organizing this absolutely superbly. And I wish you all a wonderful evening, afternoon and morning. As Katie pointed out, we're going to collect all the questions and comments and we'll respond uh, accordingly. Goodbye from me.